Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're out in the freezing cold to talk about the AR-10, but a brand new product from Ruger called the SFAR. The AR-10, the classic, this is a retro version that was sold by Brownells, no longer available as a complete rifle. But this is about as close as I'll ever get to an original AR-10. The concept was an aluminum upper and lower, polymers for uh, stocks, things like that, and a really, really lightweight fighting rifle, of course, chambering in 308. Well, this gun would later be evolved into the M16. This would kind of go the way of the Dodo, but the AR-10 has stuck around in the last 10, 15 years. It's kind of seen a resurgence and in interest with a wide variety of cartridges being offered in them. But today we're gonna to talk about the 308. But any chance I get to shoot this gun, I'll bring it out and shoot it. And today's that day. Such a classic. Let's take a look at the SFAR because it's a evolutionary step that is really interesting and a rifle that we found to be a lot of fun to shoot. A lot of folks ask me, how can I get involved in the firearms business in that particular community? And one of the best ways to do that is to become a gunsmith. Every gunsmith I know is just overbooked with work. It's a very good living. And so if you would like to become a gunsmith, you need to go to a gunsmithing school or become an apprentice for an existing gunsmith. But Modern Gun School is an accredited college that also works with veterans in the GI Bill, where you can go and get a degree from accredited college in gunsmithing and then go out and start your own gunsmithing business which I think is a really great option. Again, throughout my entire life, gunsmiths have always been able to earn a really good living, assuming they have a really strong work ethic. So please check out Modern Gun School. I do have a link in the video description below. This is the new Ruger SFAR, S-F-A-R. Stands for Short Frame Auto Loading Rifle, according to the Ruger website. So what is its claim to fame? Well, first of all, it's amazingly lightweight, which is a good thing. The gun does run a direct gas impingement system like the original AR-10, but what they've done is they've shrunk the upper and lower receiver down to where it's roughly the same size as a standard 5.56 AR-15. When we get into the internals of the gun, you'll see uh, more of what they've done in terms of shrinking the overall size of the gun, thus bringing the weight down. But this is an affordable option to another rifle out there that did something similar before Ruger took, uh, took some design notes and came up with this gun. This gun retails for right around $1,200. I did buy it online. So who gave Ruger the idea? Well, more than likely, POF gave them the idea. This is the POF revolution. Much like the SFAR, this gun was intended to be a shorter action AR-10 that was lightweight. Now, if you take a look at the Rogue, which is the super lightweight version of this, it's it's a very lightweight rifle in 308, 65 Creedmoor, like this one here. But again, you can see how it, it looks like the whole action just squished and kind of smaller. Coming back, you have a large magwell, you know, kind of a squished receiver back here. And these rifles retail for anywhere between $2,700 to $2,800, $2,900. So they're not inexpensive. But a lot of people wanted that short action and lightweight. And that's why Ruger brought the SFAR to market. Now... I have some Ruger ARs from back in the day. We did a video, I think this year, on the, take, the takedown rifle, the 5.56, and I've just never been a huge fan of Ruger AR-15s, or in this case, AR-10s. I've always kind of looked elsewhere, never really looked at them as being innovators in the space. But when this rifle came out, I reluctantly picked one up because I had so many requests to talk about it, and we've been shooting it now for a while. We actually have a video up on Patreon. It's a behind the scenes testing video, kind of shows our Patreons uh, what we do in terms of testing firearms before we make final videos like this one. If you want to check that out, just become part of our Patreon family. There's a link in the video description below. So we've done some testing with it. It has some interesting features, some interesting cuts to the receiver, to the bolt carrier. We'll talk about all of that. And then again, the shrinkage of the overall size and weight of the gun from previous AR-10s. And then let's talk a little bit about the accuracy of the rifle and what I think overall of the SFAR. Has it changed my opinion of Ruger AR-15s and AR-10s? We'll find out.
Let's go over some of the external features of the gun before we dive into the meat and potatoes, which are, is going on inside the action itself. So, of course, you can quickly see that the gun does have just standard Magpul-type furniture on it, a standard M4-type buffer tube, castle nut, all that stuff. The Magpul furniture, I'm a big fan of Magpul. It does come with a single Magpul 20-round SR25-type magazine. The gun has uh, no ambi controls, so it's like an early AR-15, right? Just has a ping pong paddle on the left-hand side, fire control selector on the left-hand side. We have a forward assist here, and then an A2 type deflector for the cases up front. You can see the fencing that's taken place, kind of a unique cut to the mag well. And I would imagine a lot of these cuts and angles and stuff have a lot to do with, you know, trying to reduce the overall weight, getting it down to that 6.8 pound weight which is really really impressive so as we move forward we have that 70 75 t6 aluminum upper and lower forged receivers that have the hard anodization on it gives it that nice dark you know color to it and then out here we have the very minimalistic m-lock rail system and underneath it you can see the mid-length gas system in here it has a four position position gas block which will be nice for adjusting it for various suppressors and then this has the 16 inch barrel, also available the 20 inch barrel. This one has a one in 10 right hand twist on the barrel. It is cold hammer forged from 4140 uh, chrome molly steel and has a 5R rifling in it, which probably adds to the accuracy of the gun. 5 8 by 24 thread out on the end. If you take a look at the optic on it, nice light gun, let's put a nice light optic on it. This one goes up to eight power. This is from Primary Arms. This is the PLX Compact. It's a one to eight by 24. 24 is the objective size lens, but it's a um, 30 millimeter tube on this bad boy. And it has one of their new scope mounts on it. This scope has the ACSS reticle in it, first focal plane. This comes with two different turret caps for the elevation. It'll come out of the box with the turret cap covered, just like you see the windage adjustment cap covering it. But then you have this tactical turret that you can put on there that makes it easy for you to do elevation adjustments without having to take your top cover off. Is an illuminated reticle as well. And then it also has this little sunshade on it that is in the box, which is a nice touch. We're shooting directly west and having a sunshade uh, really helps in the later hours of the day. Now, you'll notice it has standard AR-15 controls, including the charging handle, but this is not the charging handle that came with the gun. The charging handle that came with the gun is not ambi, doesn't release from the right-hand side, very small and hard to uh, actuate, so I put an arrow uh, charging handle in it, and we'll talk more about that in the next segment when we take the gun apart and compare it to a standard AR-15, because this is where things get really, really interesting. Field stripping the rifles just like any AR-10 or AR-15. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that the weapon is empty, and then I'm going to pop that rear pin. It'll clamshell open. Very tight fit on these pins, which is a good thing. And then pull that charging handle to the rear, take your bolt and carrier out, your T-handle. You'll notice right away the size of that thing is identical to just a 5.56 version. That's pretty impressive. Now, if you take a look at the inside, you can see that it uses a standard mil-spec trigger. This is a standard mil-spec spec trigger pocket, and then just a standard buffer tube assembly back here again compatible with ar-15 sized products that are out there now let's go ahead and set this aside here really quick for just one moment and grab my little psa ar-15 pistol and 556 i'm going to quickly make sure that this one's empty as well i'm going to crack it open just for reference take the bolt out and carrier and then take out the t-handle and as you can see the bolt and carrier of the AR-15 5.56 is the same size as the bolt and carrier of the SFAR. Now, I'll go one step further. Take the SFAR here. This is the Palmetto State Armory's charging handle. This is the Palmetto State Armory's bolt and carrier. So that is how similar this thing is to its 5.56 Brethren. Pretty darn impressive. And by using those smaller components, because standard AR-10 bolts and carriers and things like that are usually much larger than their 5.56 counterparts, that's how they're getting the weight down, shortening that action using standard AR-15 type parts. And that is just an amazing feat of engineering. So now let's take a look at the bolt and carrier itself because there's even more going on inside here because you'll notice there are some differences, obviously. 
you can see that the gas keys and stuff like that, and I'm not saying the 556, you know, this carrier would work in the SFAR. I'm just showing that it would drop in, but you can see the differences in the carrier key, things like that. So there's also uh, material differences, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So let's take a closer look at this Bolton carrier and also the receiver on the SFAR, because this is really kind of unique and really interesting what Ruger's done here. So you'll notice that the geometry is slightly different of the carrier. That's because they had to shift the trigger mechanism rearward, and we're still dealing with that 308 sized magazine well. So that's why this is different in terms of how a standard 5.56 carrier would look. But we also have these extra holes cut into the carrier itself. Four holes here. We have some holes just underneath by where the bolt goes into the carrier. And then we have the standard vent holes back here. So when gas comes down the key into the expansion chamber here, excess gases can vent here. But these are to vent excess overpressure gases as well, according to the a Ruger website and documentation. But what's even more interesting to me is this particular feature. So there's a hole right here through the receiver inside the star chamber, just outside of the chamber itself of the barrel that goes all the way through the receiver of the SFAR. It's a good sized hole. I can get that 5.56 round started in there, but that hole goes all the way through. So if you're running a baffled can, most of the gas pressure comes back down the barrel, some 90%. Then some of the overpressurized gas will come down the gas tube as well. But the vast majority of it comes back down the barrel. The bore diameter of the barrel is much larger. Now we put an ASR mount on the end of the barrel so we can run a baffled suppressor. But generally, all the testing and stuff that we've done with the gun so far has been with an OSS silencer on it. But we're going to put this baffled can on it just to test our theory to see if that reduces gas to the face of the shooter. And if it does, that's a definite boost for the popularity of this thing in my mind. So let's take this thing apart because the gun, because it's dealing with a 30 caliber cartridge and not a 5.56, they've had to beef this up a bit. So it does have a standard cotter pin, take out the firing pin. It is a titanium firing pin that has a DLC coating over it. And then we're gonna push this back, rotate the cam pin like a standard AR-15 to disassemble it. Now, no, they're not using Carpenter's 158 and the steel. They're using a uh, much more durable, according to the Ruger website, steel that will handle the additional pressures of the 30 caliber cartridge. But you'll also notice if you take a look at the bolt head and the radius cuts made to the bolt lugs themselves are designed to strengthen the bolt lugs. And then we also have dual ejectors over here on the side. So, Different material, not Carpenter's 158. Rethought the geometry and radiuses of the bolt lugs. Those dual extractor or dual ejectors with a single AR-15 type extractor, but you'll notice it's a little bit different in terms of its overall design. And then direct gas impingement. Obviously, here's your expansion chamber back here with the three piston rings. And so very, very cool. And one other thing I wanted to point out is that if you take a look at the handguard. It's held in place by two tensioning screws. It does index off the receiver, so it'll keep it from rotating, clocking. And then we out here in front of you, the um, handguard, we have QD mounts on both sides. The M lock is at the three, six, and nine o'clock positions. And then it's just smooth here. And then you have the 1913 rails at the fore and aft part of the lightweight handguard. All right, with that being said, let's run. We got 10 rounds in here, and this is American Eagle 150 grain ball. This is from our friends over at Federal. They did supply this ammunition free of charge to the channel. We want to thank them for doing that. Been shooting Federal since I was a kid. Love this stuff. All right, so we're going to do this inside because we want to see, with no wind, just what the gas is like with a baffled can on it and see where that gas is coming from and if it's going to gas me out like a normal suppressor would on an AR type rifle. Okay, Woo. I can see gas going sideways, but there's just so much of it with a baffled can. I'm still getting gassed out, guys. But it does look like those vents are pushing gas out sideways because it definitely looked like on my peripheral vision, I could see 
jets of gas going out I don't normally see. But inside in a zero wind environment, it's not enough <laughs> for a baffled cam. Let's put the OSS back on it. Now you've seen us talk about the Normie ammunition in past videos, and we've had pretty good luck with it. Some guns love it, other guns treat it just like any other, you know, 147 grain ball ammo. This gun happens to really like it, and this stuff happens to be really affordable. So you can go out there and you can shoot your groups and you can get MOA, or maybe a little over, accuracy out of it if you do your part. Very, very cool. Now, I have some of the Norma ammunition loaded up. I'm going to stretch its legs out to 250 yards. I'm just going to use the BDC of the ACSS reticle and the primary arms optic that we have here. But again, I can sit here and spot my own shots. The glass on this is so clear. I really love these optics. But uh, let's just ring that challenge target out 250 yards. has a very crisp, light trigger pull. The trigger that Ruger puts in there, I forget what they call it, but it's their own trigger, and it just has a really, really good feel to it. It's not too light where it's gonna bump fire, which some 308s will do. So it's not gonna bump fire, but it's still gonna give you a really, really good trigger for improved accuracy. Overall, guys, Ruger knocked this one out of the park. Again, if all the, S the SFAR rifles are just like this one in terms of accuracy and performance, fitment, all the other stuff, this is probably the AR-10 to buy right now. If you're on a budget, you don't want to go spend a bunch of money on a DD. You don't want to spend a bunch of money on a POF, but you want something that's going to be accurate, reliable, lightweight, and give you all those features that the more expensive rifles offer. Man, you just can't beat this thing. It is just so aggressively priced and so well done. I'm going to applaud Ruger. So, well done, guys. I'm really, really happy with this rifle. When we first got it in, we were just ready to go, eh, another AR-10 just a knockoff of the POF, probably doesn't work very well and slings lead everywhere. Complete opposite. So check them out if you're interested in an AR-10 and 308. Guys, if you enjoy videos like this one, please consider becoming part of our Patreon family. There is a link in the video description below. Also check us out on Twitter. I'll put a link to Twitter down below. I keep forgetting to do that, but we're very active over on Twitter because we're not shadow banned any longer on Twitter. Also right here on YouTube, you got that little join button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Mash that join button and you can support us right here on YouTube in the age of demonetization. And last but not least, please swing my checkout Copper Custom. Thank you for 14 years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon. Oh yeah, and Happy New Year. That's coming up. Ha, ha, ha.